Welcome to Taking Care of Lady Business, where we put the business back in lady business. Hosted by Jennifer Justice, founder and CEO of the Justice Department, a management strategy and law firm that works with female and woke male entrepreneurs, executives, talent, brands, and creatives to build and maximize their wealth, focusing in the areas of tech, consumer product, finance, media, entertainment, and fashion. Jennifer interviews entrepreneurial women who have done it all, who will be sharing their secrets on all things business, especially as a woman. These highly successful women will share strategies and insights, including what not to do and what it takes to win. And now, here's your host, Jennifer Justice. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Taking Care of Lady Business. I'm Jennifer Justice. Today on the pod, we have the lovely, fascinating Shama Maher. She is a Renaissance woman, so it's hard to describe in one kind of sentence what she does. So I'm going to leave it to her. But in a nutshell, she's a CEO as a service to companies launching and scaling and also a Web3 expert. So we're going to get a little of that trickled in as well. Hi, Shama. How are you? Hey, JJ. I'm doing really good. Thanks for asking. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Well, let's dive into what you've been doing in the past so we can get to why and what it means to be, uh, why you are and what it means to be a CEO as a service. Yeah, of course, of course. Well, I, I feel really blessed to have worked through my own like self-reflection of how I operate in the world. And so the first part of my career, I was just climbing corporate ladders at big, sexy fashion companies and couldn't quite understand why I would go into a company, do something really amazing and fantastic, and then get bored and want to leave. And finally, I realized that my core competency was really in what I like to call big delta moves and being able to do um, big things in short periods of time. And so that really led me to starting my own kind of consultancy and later creative agency where I would work with these first time founders who are looking for big change, um, big change going from zero to one, big change from launch to scale um, and helping them kind of get all of these components together. And so I finally was able to create a business model that worked for my personality type and my style. And that is something I feel truly blessed about. So talk about what are these big Delta moves? Like give us an example of what it is like something. Yeah. That, a big Delta. Yeah. That made um, you have that vision because, you know, I think that's something, something that everybody kind of looks for. It's like, what am I not only good at, but what do I really love, you know? Totally. You know, for me, it was understanding how to almost game myself, right? Like what are the things that would motivate me to uh, to light me up? And for, it's such a, business to me is so personal and oftentimes quite spiritual in the sense that like when everything lights up, you can go fast. And you know, when things are not lining up, it, it just, it, it's hard, it's sticky, it doesn't go as quickly. And so my personality type is definitely one that likes to move fast and, and move in big ways. And I'll give you a, a couple examples. You know, I had a client once who was working with me. They started off doing $250,000 in revenue. In about five years, we got them to 10 million. It was a big move. Another project that I actually co-founded back in 2020, launched the company and in uh, six months scaled it to 3 million. So it is, you know, it's one of those things where I think as a serial CEO, if you will, when you understand kind of how to orchestrate, I believe these five areas of business along sales, marketing, you know, product operations and finance, you can kind of take these components and apply them to lots of different types of businesses. So it's interesting to actually see kind of the parallels of business modeling between things like fashion and consumer, and then obviously things like Web3, blockchain, and technology businesses. Mm -hmm. um, the same kind of thinking, but applied in these different ways can actually achieve really similar results. So is there a lot of like ramp up and learning when you're doing this stuff in the different industries? Because you came from fashion, right? Yeah. So, you know, what's really cool for me is that the this transition or, or kind of movement into working more on the tech side Again, to kind of go back to spirituality and business, for me, Web3, when I first started learning about it, um, 
just rang so resonant with me along these areas of like sovereignty and data collection and, you know, how we look at our identities in the world. And then also the consumer application of these things. And so I think when you are kind of consumer focused, go to market and customer adoption and how you craft it becomes very similar. You know, when it comes to kind of the components of it, just like I'm not a product developer, I'm also not an engineer. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to design and make a pair of shoes and I don't know how to build code, right? So I really rely on kind of the strength of my founders who have passion and vision in their core discipline in that industry to bring that to the table as I orchestrate and build model um, and scale around that. So does that include you hiring other people, like doing 1099? Like, how do you do that? Yeah, it's really, it's really cool. So basically what I do is I, I create a system such that I, I delete myself by the end. So in the beginning, yeah, it's make yourself redundant. Like, yeah, Great exactly. business model, Shama. No. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. And yeah. um, so it's really cool. So it's like, I get to come in, I get to really understand like the business components. I then also, I triangulate against three things. One is like founders core competencies and their strengths and what they can do. The other is kind of traditional like budgeting and capitalization of the business. And then also kind of speed to market and goals. And I triangulate those, those three and then kind of come up with like what our game plan is. From there, we then operationalize. So now we're hiring people. My founders are typically learning their own management styles, which is really challenging. A lot of them usually come from core disciplines where they know how to do the thing, but not run a business. Yeah. So it's kind of almost like an M MBA master masterclass, if you will, on how the hell do you do this damn thing? And um, so we hire people. And then by the end, they have a team. And by the end, like I am on to the next thing. So it kind of suits my own personality style. Um, I get a lot of like dopamine hits from it. I feel good. I'm great at it. They feel good. There's progress. There's no sense of why do I not already know how to run a PNL? Well, why would you know how to run a PNL? Yeah. You've been an engineer your whole life. Like no one's taught you how to do that, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, but all else, I mean, when you do it, you do it from launch. I mean, it sounds expensive, right? If you're going to like hire you, hire all of this team, this is like what kind of businesses, these are funded businesses at this point. Self-funded or um, VC backed. Yeah. So, you know, I think that in the realm, and this is just so true in the realm of fashion or anything consumer focused, you know, you can't get anywhere without being capitalized, you know, you, you need money. And I think that that is uh, the conversation that I often get to with folks who do not have resources is like, Hey, get a job, you know, and like save your money and like right. find other ways of engaging. And I actually am very much against this idea that everyone should be an entrepreneur. I think it's way overly glamorized. I think, yeah, no, that's for sure. Too. It. You yeah. know, that I have the money, the grit, all of that. So I try to discourage <laughs> as much yeah. as possible people uh people starting companies yeah i mean i think i think it's over glamorized too i think it's you know a lot of people spin their wheels and um they might have great ideas but just have a really hard time executing on them getting the the mind share of the public the marketing etc so it's not as easy as everyone thinks it is yeah. And so, and not everybody has this big exit where you're making, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars either. Not even That's, close. you know, when you say that, it really reminds me of something important. And I know you and I have connected just so much about how women and finances and money. And, you know, it's one of the things that I just love the most about what you evangelize. And I think in this realm of entrepreneurship, most women are not considering their future in terms of, you know, how do I actually, how am I saving money to protect my my future, regardless of what's going on with the current stage of this business. And um, looking at finances, both in terms of fundraising and, and getting the business going, but also in terms of life, you know, it's um, it, it's a really important thing. It's certainly the first business you have is not your last business, you know, and there is such thing as like businesses collapsing and ending because you need to move on and not having the attachment to that. And so I think that, most women I speak to have an idea of like being a lifer in their business, you know, and it's very much like I'm going to have, and this is going to be the only thing, but what happens when it's not, 
you know, yeah. like, what do you do? No, it's true. Uh, yeah. You can't take it so personally and it's not, you know, it's not like your husband, right? It's not like somebody or your partner for life. Or, you know, it's not like you can change them out all the time, Like you can move on. Like, yeah. All right. So doing all this and you were doing a lot in like fashion, et cetera. And then, so how did you get into web three? What was that transition and, and what fascinated you about it? Oh my God, transition, so but you know, yeah, you know, I, um, I first got exposure in 2014 when I was brought on board, uh, to help launch a retail store in the West village and my client, we actually ended up launching the first Bitcoin ATM machine back then. And I honestly just had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, what is this? Like, okay, cool. It's like a PR stunt. Like, I don't know. Like, this is cool. I think Bitcoin at the time was like, so, it was so cheap. It was like, we didn't really know what was going on. That was my first time getting exposure. And then, um, I would circle back around my, my ex-husband had actually been writing a book on, technology and the future of Silicon Valley and um, like a humanist sort of perspective on technology. And I'd met one of the early founders of Ethereum back in 2017. And that was my next kind of go around with getting into the space was like, interesting, like this is much larger implications and, you know, what does this really mean? And so that was my second time getting interested in it. And then it wouldn't be until really kind of 2020, late 2020, early 2021, that I really found myself um, in the throngs of it. And I think my first, maybe it was like middle of summer of 2020, I think I gave a, a quote in Glossy about, you know, how brands were starting to look at this as kind of an approach to, to get in front of a new customer. And um, that was when it really clicked for me that there was this very like retail centric consumer focus that Web3 could have. Before that, I saw it more as like, just a tech, a tech platform, a new form of technology, um, something that I wouldn't necessarily need to know about, um, but it was a nice to know. And then all of a sudden it became really clear to me that this was going to have uh, really massive effects in terms of how consumers related to themselves. So right. as I saw it kind of tie more and more into consumer and retail application, I was like, oh shit, I get this. <laughs> Right, right, right. And so how are you involved in it now? What are you seeing? What trends and what interests you in it? Yeah, I think the biggest issue right now is that there's a lot of confusion about what Web3 is. And I think for me, my biggest passion point is that, you know, it is actually just a piece of technology that can really help businesses do things faster and better. And um, and a lot of companies will be introducing it and using it without necessarily consumers knowing it, right? It's like, it's like AI, like AI is embedded in so many of the things that we integrate and use. And most consumers have like a negative feeling about AI, but they love it and they're using it and they don't even know. So I right. think that, you know, blockchain in and of itself is going to have a very similar kind of go to market on an infrastructure standpoint. Then you have all this other sort of like more marketing driven consumer community stuff. Um, which honestly, I think has taken a, a huge hit. And I think that we're starting to see large companies um, integrate more and more. Like Nike just came out with um, a new program that they're launching around NFTs and collaboration and community building. And I think sadly, as with most major movements in consumer, it is the large companies that have the resources to invest, to experiment that ultimately set the stage for what best practices look like. And um, therefore, you know, these things are expensive. So therefore, I think, you know, in this next iteration of Web3, I think it's the major players that are going to set the game. Hopefully it'll make things a little bit cheaper and easier to access from like a modeling and execution standpoint. So smaller businesses can use it. But my involvement has been, is really cool. Like I get to do like all this cool stuff. So right now I'm co-CEOing um, a music protocol that's being built on Ethereum, uh, music distribution and music um, streaming. And it is so exciting. It's been the most incredible journey of working with young, brilliant, talented visionaries and just an incredible team of people who are brilliant at what they do. And I'm currently advising uh, two other companies in the space. One's doing safety and security on blockchain. The other is doing 
um, marketing kind of um, deployment and a new sort of tokenomics around marketing and advertising on chain. Um, and then I've invested in a few companies on like social tokens. And so what's interesting is my involvement has really moved towards kind of the infrastructure, you know, how do we actually create the picks and shovels uh, okay. to be able to build something long lasting? And what does that entail? Like, you know, what do you mean by the picks and shovels? Yeah, it's like, it's like when we think about how do we build something that is so powerful, right? The thing that other people need that isn't sexy. Right. And I'm kind of tired of the sexy stuff. You know, I feel like I've had a lot of sexy and um, sexy is good. Money is sexy. Picks and shovels make a lot of money, you know? So right, my, there are things that my, everything needs in order for the system to work. And exactly. so if if we have this system and like you're talking about how Nike and setting the stage, like what does that look like? Why is it so expensive right now for smaller companies to be involved in this? I mean, isn't the whole point is it's like decentralized and anybody can join in Web3? Yeah. And you can, but it's kind of like launching a company. Anyone can launch a company, but is it going to be any good? Right. Is it actually going to be consumer friendly? Are people actually going to buy it? I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've spoken to someone on the phone who launched a high end luxury fill in the blank has the most incredible product and their website's shitty. Their copywriting's bad. The go to market, everything else is bad, but they have this like incredible essence of an like beautiful handmade crafted product that has no margin and can't sell it's very similar in web it's like you can enter the space like shop in, enter something you know build something quickly it is so accessible but you can't um fake the funk when it comes so you were talking about nike and how you know they kind of are setting they can set the tone but i mean isn't the whole point of web three is, is decentralized and anybody can enter into it yeah i mean it's kind of like Shopify, right? It's like anyone can open up a store and it's easy and sometimes free to do it, but is it going to look good? Is it actually something that you want to buy and consume and engage with? And so, gosh, I feel like when Shopify came on the scene, it was like, everyone opened up an e-commerce store and then you got flooded with what I like to call the e-commerce graveyard. I think it's very similar with Web3. I right. think we saw all of these projects, all these things come up, and now there's a bit of a graveyard. And it's like, yeah, just because you can pop it up doesn't mean you understand brand. It doesn't mean you understand copywriting and like consumer engagement. It doesn't mean you understand how to even run a PL and in a business model. All it means is you knew how to like do one little thing of the entire piece of the pie in order to get it going. So I think that sadly, as we see in terms of setting the stage and, and what is good, you know, we actually do need companies that have, or individuals that have resources where they can experiment, take things to market, see what works and create um, create these sort of templates for us where we can say, hey, this is a working model. It's really similar, I think, in also in terms of sustainability, right? Everyone, all these small companies want to do things sustainably, but it's also like really expensive to do things sustainably. Sometimes you need companies who have purchasing power and the ability to, to scale it to then allow for the trickle down effects so that smaller companies can reap the benefits. And I think right. Web3 is similar. Right. And so how do you get there? Hire, hire you. <laughs> <laughs> Have a shit ton of money, hire someone fabulous like myself, get you on board. And like, you know, we can, there you go. <laughs> we can rock and roll. I think a lot of it has to do with being smart. And I think, unfortunately, my messaging around, hey, like, think about this business in terms of the life cycle of a company and what you want to build and what the end goal is, like, start from the end and work backwards. And I think, unfortunately, that means fewer people starting companies that I think maybe shouldn't be. And I right. think that means more people who have that sort of thinking taking more risk. You know, I think that there are heavily capitalized people who are, you know, very, very risk averse. Um, and I think those sorts of opening up our minds to how do we create impact and change and use our resources to do things that are really exciting. Like I would like to see more of that. But unfortunately, I think it's I think it's a tough game. You know, I tell people it takes about 18 to 24 months to really see like 
how your brand responds in the market Mm -hmm. and 18 to 24 months of running fully operationalized. is a lot of money. And um, most people don't realize that they say like, I have this amount of money to spend for the next six months. And I'm like, well, save your money and go on vacation because, (laughs) because having a small amount of money or only thinking about it in small chunks doesn't actually give you the opportunity to think about your business modeling from a larger standpoint. If we know you have X amount of money over two years, right? We can do so much more in terms of how we set it up, guide it and experiment with it than if we're looking at these like really small tranches of money in any sort of business. Right, yeah. I know it's hard to get there, right? In particular with women, it's like, that's the whole point. It's like, we can't raise that money to get to that point in the first place. You know, and that's where the rub is. I really wish, you know, as I've seen so many consumer brands pop up, my my wish and what I see is really going to be really important is lateral movements. You know, like I think that there are opportunities and we'll hopefully see this in the next year as this, you know, uh, recession and these things start to fall out is like, how do we actually say, you know what, each of us don't necessarily need to start our own business. Like, how do we come together and pull resources and actually look more laterally at building teams and building companies? Yeah. Uh, No, I love that because, you know, how we built Rock Nation was basically by doing joint ventures and JVing with people who didn't have the same, who had complementary capabilities to ours, but not the exact same. So we weren't in competition. We were just growing our capabilities that way and bringing that all together. So I think that's such a good and important point in particular with all these women, you know, that all have different experiences, like coming together, building something together with a common theme and adding more services than you can bring or provide by yourself, you know? And it's cheaper that way, right? So anytime I talk to a founder, I always say, well, make a list of your core competencies and then we have to fill in around that. Yeah. And, you know, filling in around that, depending on your core competencies can get expensive. And so when you think about coming together more laterally with, you know, a bigger C-suite or a different formation of how we look at business. Like one of the things I love about web three is this concept of a, of a DAO and, you know, probably for another podcast episode, but um, this idea of how we look at voting rights and operating a business and, you know, even the, this modeling, I think the easiest way to talk about it is as like a co-op model, right? So like, what if we have these co-op operating models of how we are launching and scaling and growing such that like, you know, we, we're all invested. We all have a say in it. We're all kind of, we're all, we're on this very large kind of democratized board, if you will, as indicated by our voting rights. And, um, and we can make these decisions and pool our resources together. And that I think is, is important because knowing the stats are kind of stocked up against us in terms of raising institutional capital, um, we have to find other ways of winning. And yeah. I think that like bitching about it is great because we need to make a lot of noise. And I also think we just need to get smart because if we want to like yeah. build something, we can't let that keep us down. Exactly. No, it's like building them in a non-traditional way, you know, and thinking about, you know, strategic marketing, putting women on cap tables, even if they have smaller amounts of money, because we control the purchasing power. And if we're invested and have skin in the game, you know, we then we can't, then we'll talk more about it. You know, thinking about instead of putting the $25,000 for a gala dinner for a philanthropy or charity that's been around for 25 years when they're all started and meant to be redundant, why don't we put that in a, a, in a company? You know what I mean? And invest instead. You can do both or split, split the baby, you know, and half in there and half in an in investment. So we can build upon that and that economy in the matriarchy. And I think that is what is so important. And I love, so I do love Web3 and in particular, again, a lot of the NFT projects like Mavion that we're both in, you know, to think about how you're building community as well as getting like really cool products and jewelry, you know, at the same time and having those utilities around it. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that like, I think what's also interesting is most people don't realize that they are capable of investing. And so I think that, you know, from a, how do I show up to the world 
leveraging my resources to fully support the business's values and ideas and people that I believe in. You know, I think if we reframe the way we think about our resources, financial resources, time resources, and we think of our lives as our own personal VCs, you know, Shama as a VC, which I'm not, but you know, Shama as right, a, right, right. as a VC, it's like, well, I'm going to be using my time to support these things. I'm using my yeah. money to support these things. And that I think is kind of shifting the paradigm on like our capabilities. And I think that women come to the table with are very resourced, but needing to understand what resources are and how you use them, um, I think is, is a very powerful approach to like sovereignty and kind of owning our contribution and um, who we know is just as, or if not sometimes more important than what we have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that introduction to someone else might've saved your company a hundred thousand dollars and hiring someone to make that introduction, right. Or to be able to close that gap or put in a good word. So our impact, I think, reaches far beyond sometimes what we give ourselves credit for. Yeah, exactly. So tell us, what do you think, like of the things that you're finding interesting in like web three in particular, not just interesting. I mean, I know we've talked about some of it, but like everybody right now in particular, like FTX going under, right. And filing bankruptcy in like crypto, because everybody af associates web three with crypto and crypto is, you know, we just thought it was going to be a winter. It's like a season <laughs> in like a couple seasons now. Um, it's beyond winter. It's like spring, summer, and fall. So like what, you know, what is your take on, on this and, and how it affects web three and yeah, things moving I forward? Think, I think that there's going to be a real need for delineation on kind of taking it circle back to what we said earlier about like, you know, there's the technology component, which is like building your program on like Python or Ruby on Rails. It's going to be like, I've built it on Ethereum and it has nothing to do with cryptocurrency. And it's what just, is Python? Better, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like how people built like, you know, it's like computer programming. <laughs> okay. All right. Remember not we're like, talking to like me. Okay. I'm like, what is Python? I don't like snakes. Not like my um, Python handbag in my closet. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So I think we're going to be looking at the technology as its own thing, right? And I think that that doesn't necessarily require any regulation, just like JavaScript doesn't require regulation. It's just a way in which you kind of build code and you build programs and software. So I think there's a technology component of Web3 that is really being invested in and, and people are um, focused more on that. And that just has long-term, very long-term impacts. And this whole crypto winter thing is not derailing those sorts of advances. Like that is still right. very much full. Um, crypto needs to be regulated. You know, yeah. I think that um, there's a huge need to regulate it. I think that as an alternative currency model, I think it's great, yeah. um, but I think it does need to be regulated. And um, I think, unfortunately, we're probably going to be hearing increasingly coming out, I hope, you know, in terms of what our government will say and do about this. Unfortunately, because there wasn't any regulation, lots of people who had access to investing lost a lot of money. Yeah. And, uh, and they're not know, getting it back. They're not getting it back. And there's right. no one to hold accountable for that. And, exactly. um, and I do believe that like everyone should have access to invest and everyone should have the opportunity to make and lose money. I think the best thing about this is understanding your own risk tolerance, mm -hmm. which is something else we don't talk about. Like, you know, I've had a couple of businesses that I invested in close in the last couple of years. And I'm like, okay, yeah. great to know my risk tolerance. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Nice no, reminder. I have too. I have too. And it sucks. You know, it's like, when am I going to get the windfall that Sally Joe just had? You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know That's a Sally important. Joe. She's a made up person, but it's that. Yeah. And you know, you lose money too, but, yeah, uh, but risk is knowing risk is important. And I think that like, and understanding like your own intuition is important. And like, I made a lot of investments out of FOMO and guess what? They didn't do go well. It was really out of FOMO. And I'm like, okay, these are really expensive and good learning experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that is important in terms of crypto regulation and also just people having a better personal understanding of like 
this is not the last time we're going to be in an area of this like FOMO, hypey, new things happening. I mean, this is going to continue again. It's cyclical, right? So I think that was a really great level set for everyone else. Um, now, in terms of like NFTs and all these like projects and things that, you know, we're a part of and that are still launching, um, I think it's exciting because the communities that were built around that at that time are full of really incredible humans. Yeah. <laughs> so like, so I'm really grateful um, for the communities that I chose to engage with. Now, if you asked me this one year ago, I was like, on 30 Discord servers and like, you know, very overly indexed on community. And now I've really trimmed down and I'm like, all right, who are the people, values, ideas that I really believe in that I want to spend my time in? And so yeah. looking at my resources from that perspective, I think has been valuable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. It's really hard to figure out what you want to spend your time on with. I was like, you know, you want to be in the future. Everybody keeps saying it's like, it's, you know, web 1.0, 2.0. We were left out of all of them. Our friend Michelle Reeves like talks about it so well and eloquently all the time. It's like, we weren't, we didn't miss the boat. The boat wasn't meant for us. Right. And so this is the time where we can actually you know, build our own boat, our own table, our own everything and figure out how we can all benefit from that um, personally. Personal. But it's, but it's, yeah. And, but the thing is also, it's everybody's like, oh, this thing's over. No, no, no. Remember this all crashed before with web one and two and like, it's just, it's still an early, like not even, it's like an innovation. It's not even early adoption yet, you know? You know, it's I think going anywhere is like this idea of like women in web three. I think um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about like what that means to me. And I feel like web three needs to be better defined in terms of women in what spaces, you know, yeah. there's the like technology side, there's like women who are like community driven and focused in these NFT projects. There's like, you know, it's, it's like, it's like say it, it's so generalized, right? And there's like women who are in decentralized finance, which doesn't really have a lot of crossover with like, you know, fashion NFTs or music blockchain or, mm -hmm. you know, so I think that there's like a need to kind of silo a little bit more of these, these categories. And then also like this idea of bringing women on board, I think is so powerful and also what they're coming on board to and what the invitation is, I think also needs to be really clear, you know, yeah. like, like, it's not like, Hey, I'm in web three. I bought an NFT. I mean, yeah, like technically you're in web three, but like, it's more like understanding enough about this to understand what of it you care about and what of it is important to you and what of it actually aligns with a current skill set and is easily transferable. Like in a, a wish that I have is that like, women who have extremely women who have skill sets that have been undervalued in other arenas have an opportunity now to like showcase highlight and come to the front by taking those skill sets and applying them into a new industry mm -hmm. and um but what those applications are of those skill sets and like the invitation and and like that piece of it i think we're kind of needing to needing to do more right very well said. Amazing. Well, look, we could talk all day about all of this, including like getting into DAOs, which we did not really, but um, for next time. So, you know, every guest I ask this one same question, and that is, what's the worst advice you've ever received? Yeah. Okay. I was... I was waiting. I was like working at a job. So like I mentioned earlier, I never held a job longer than two years because I would get bored and go in, do something big and leave. And I always knew that there would be another thing. And I had a girlfriend of mine, very, very, very close friend of mine who saw me struggling. And she was like, well, why don't you just like, she's like, why don't you just stay in this job? Like, why don't you just stay? And then my mom echoed the same thing. And it was like, why don't you just stay? And it was the worst piece of advice because it was done out of love and safety and wanting me to be protected, but it was also antithetical to my values. Mm -hmm. And um, which is like, if something doesn't feel right, move, yeah. move, move, like do not wait, move. 
And in fact, this idea of like, you know, this idea of like, don't move and like stay in a place where you're unhappy or out of a need to protect me is something I've experienced a lot in my life. Yeah. And um, be secure, you know, you yeah. never know, like not taking bets on yourself, you know, oh, not trusting that you could get through it no matter what anyway. And the thing I can say the most in my entire life, the one thing that has never failed me is my gut. Mm -hmm. Never, ever, ever. So worst piece of advice that I got, but also really good gut check. Cause the nice thing about bad advice is it helps you realize what the right thing is. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. This was awesome. If people want to find you, how do they do that? Thanks, JJ. Um, people can find me on Twitter at my first and last name at Shama Maher. Um, they can also find me at my full name, shamamaher.com uh, to find out more about me. And I'm I'm excited. I'm excited to build with you, JJ. I'm just always in awe of the women you speak to, the impact that you have, and um, excited to see what, what the future comes for us. Thank you. To everyone listening here, I'm sure you learned a lot. Now you know where to find Shama. And thank you for listening to this episode of Taking Care of Lady Business. I'm Jennifer Justice.